Namaskar and uh, most pleasant afternoon to everyone here today. On behalf of the President of the National Council of Indian Culture, Dr. Devaki Nanan Sharma, our hardworking uh, Board of Directors, and the NCIC Heritage Center, I'd like to warmly welcome everyone here today to the formal launch of our exhibition for Indian Heritage Month 2022. The month thus far has been quite busy because in addition to organizing this exhibition, the NCIC has embarked on five distinct cultural programs as well, which started off uh, two weeks ago. And um, today, particularly, we would be uh, launching the exhibition, which you are going to hear much more about as we go through this, evening, this afternoon's program. So welcome, and it is my most pleasant duty to introduce to you our presenter for today's uh, program. She is uh, Miss Sarika Budu. Uh, English teacher, and uh, she has been involved with the work of the NCIC for quite some time now. She was um, our, the, the, the leader of our uh, youth arm of the NCIC, and she's also a member of the Heritage Center Committee. And actually, Sarika has been the coordinator for this uh, exhibition that we have here before us today. So it is in my pleasure to invite um, Sarika to take us through the proceedings of this program. Thank you very much, Mr. Dirub Timal, who is the chairman of the National Council of Indian Cultures Heritage Center. Sitaram, namaste, assalamu alaikum, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to take you through this afternoon's proceedings as we get ready to launch a most wonderful and unique experience of exhibiting visual arts and books, as well as posters on early Indian cinema. This afternoon, we also honor two celebrated authors, Dr. Lakshmi Pasad and Dr. Primnath Gupta, and we thank you for joining with us today and for being part of this momentous occasion. Trinidad and Tobago has benefited greatly from the indelible contributions brought to us by our forefathers 177 years ago. Through the decades, dance has become part of our country's mainstream culture. To begin today's festivities, as expressing patriotism for the beauty and love of our motherland, let us welcome warmly to our stage the Radha Krishna Dance Group.
Radha Krishna dance group and I do apologize for the small delay in their performance due to some technical issues. Today we honor two authors and one of those prolific writers is Dr. Lakshmi Pasad. Dr. Lakshmi Pasad ranks high in the pantheon of Caribbean and British literature. Born and raised in Paje village, Tunapuna, she clearly demonstrated the possibilities that colonial society allowed for talented persons. After her primary and secondary education in Tunapuna and St. Augustine, she proceeded to Belfast University, where she graduated in geography, and then to Reading University, where she qualified in education. Returning to the Caribbean, she taught at a secondary level in Trinidad at St. Augustine Girls High School, Barbados at Harrison College, and in Guyana at Queen's College. In 1974, she moved to London with her husband, Professor Bishudat Pissard, sorry, a distinguished economist. In a short time, she established herself as a short story writer whose offerings were presented on the BBC World Service. This gave her the necessary confidence to embark on a writing career that lasted from 1990 to 2012. Her novels were Butterfly in the Wind, Shastra, for the love of my name, Raise the Lantern High, and Daughters of Empire. These novels range widely in their coverage of Caribbean experiences, Indian diaspora adjustments in the United Kingdom, and the nostalgia of women who grew up under the British rule, after which they settled in various parts of the empire. All of these novel novels represent a world that no longer exists. They portray real life and urban lifestyles that are now historical and need to be preserved as this author does. In the words of Dr. Dale Tuwari in 2004, he wrote, the book sought to empower women, Trinidadian and Caribbean women. She writes about strong women who add to the family and the community, who are educated and enlightened, who are thought leaders in their respective domains. The relevance of Dr. Lakshmi Pasad's body of literature has been proven by its continuous use in secondary schools in the Caribbean and the University of the West Indies campuses. She's also a standard reference at British universities. For her stellar writings, she has been honored here and abroad. At Warwick University, the Lakshmi Pasad Fellowship has been established. In 2006, she was honored at Carrie Festa and at 
and in 2007, the Hindu Women's Organization of Trinidad and Tobago recognized her work. In 2012, the National Library Nalis gave her a Lifetime Literary Award, and in 2013, the University of West Indies awarded her an honorary doctorate for her exemplary writing. In October of 2019, here, she was the chief guest and honorary at the Diwali Nagar celebrations hosted by the National Council of Indian Culture of Trinidad and Tobago. Now in retirement in London, Dr. Passad spends time with her children, Rajendra, Avinash, and Sharda. She would always remain an icon whose career in teaching and writing has earned her a permanent place in our treasure box of precious memories. It is with great privilege that the NCIC's Heritage Center honor Dr. Passad as part of its 2022 Heritage Month celebrations. Unfortunately, Dr. Prasad could not be here with us in person, but her son, Mr. Avinash Prasad, has traveled all the way from Barbados to generously and graciously accept this award, which would be presented by Dr. Dev Ginanan Sharma, the president of the NCIC. Dr. Sharma and Mr. Prasad, if you please join me at the front. Good evening. Um, it, it's a great privilege and honor to be here today. I want to thank, thank the organizers, compliment, congratulate you on this great uh, celebration. I spoke to mum this morning uh, about it before I came, and uh, she was really very uh, honored, very excited, um, and, and, and very happy. So thank you very much for making a happy mum, which <laughs> clearly makes a happy family. Um, if I were to think uh, and say a few personal words uh, about Mum as a writer, we're going to hear perhaps later about some of the writing. Um, you know, I, I think uh, of her unusual story as a daughter uh, in an Indian family going to college, going to university uh, very early on. This would have been late 50s. Um, I think of someone who was a, a geography teacher who uh, changed careers and became a writer and a successful writer. And I think for all of those budding writers out there, that's a story uh, that uh, if, if you want to write, you should write. Um, I think of the fact that she, um, uh, her books show a, a great diversity of voice. Butterfly in the Wind, which is one of the required readings for people doing Caribbean literature uh, at Cape, um, is, is the voice of an innocent young lady growing up, a young girl growing up as, in, uh, as Trinidad uh, reaches for its independence and thinks about who, what it is and who it is. Um, um, Shastra is a love story. Very hard for a son to read a love story from your mother. Um, Shastra is a love story, but it's also a serious tackling and dealing with uh, issues of, of women, modern women in modern society growing up in a Hindu culture. Uh, and some of the, not, this is not from a stereotypical perspective, but about the incongruities, about some of the inconsistencies, and some of the ways in which uh, society is, is, is modernizing, uh, and, and where w women's uh, role and power uh, can be properly expressed. Uh, For the Love of Thy Name, my favorite book, uh, is, is really a political story about the, the treatment of the Indian community in Guyana. Uh, but it's really a story that is bigger than just a, a, a racial story, but a story of, of all peoples and, uh, suffering from, from strong and powerful and, uh, uh, um, um, uh, governments and bullying governments. Um, so I think of these different voices. I think of these um, different stories. And, and in all of her writing, uh, she tried to say something of meaning to say something of, of take a, a personal story and give it greater meaning. 
Uh, and the other thing I would say, uh, as, as again, as a personal story, because we'll hear from more qualified people to talk about her writing, but um, is she inspired us all. She inspired us all to be writers. She inspired us to, um, to think that words matter and to think carefully about words. Uh, I've become a speech writer for some of the uh, prime ministers you may know in the region. Uh, I, I, I'm an economist, but the way I write and articulate economics comes not from my father, but from my mother. Uh, my brother is a psychiatrist and who has now penned many well-known books. Um, my, my, um, my wife has now won the Costa Book Award, the, the Commonwealth Short Story Competition, the BBC Short Story Competition. My sister is a writer. All of that, really, because of our mother. And so we are grateful uh, for uh, your celebration. We're grateful for her journey. Uh, and we're grateful for this community in encouraging her, supporting her, uh, and pushing her. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Mr. Avinash Prasad. Our second honorary and uh, prolific writer being honored here this evening is Dr. Primnath Gupta. During the last five decades, Dr. Primnath Gupta has been doing pioneering cultural, religious, and literary work. Some of his outstanding achievements are that in 1975, he was the co-founder of the National Hindu Youth Organization, later renamed Hindu Jawan Sangh, which organizes several activities for the benefit of uh, Hindu youth, such as conferences, leadership workshops, seminars, and uh, cultural exchange tours. The group led the way in the revival of the Pagwa celebration and chow tao singing in the country. From 1979 to 2000, 2009, he was an assistant secretary of the Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha. During this time, he was instrumental in the introduction of children's Pagwa celebrations and in organizing other cultural activities such as Indian Arrival Day, Diwali, Pagwa, and leadership workshops on education and various cultural activities. In 1991, he was the co-founder and first president of the National Ramila Council of Trinidad and Tobago. When the group started, there were 10 Ramila groups, but by 2006, the membership in the council had grown to 25. In 2013, he was a principal organizer of the first international Ram Miller conference held in Trinidad, attracting international scholars from Mauritius, France, South Africa, Fiji, India, Guyana, and Suriname, among other countries. This was followed by another pioneering international conference, the World Pagwa Conference in 2021, under the auspices of the National Council of Indian Culture. This event once again placed this nation in the international spotlight. He has also been president of the Sangha Grandi Ramlila Committee for 25 years and the president of the Sangha Grandi Pagwa Committee for 30 years. In 2012 to the present, Dr. Gupta has been an activist with the NCIC and has not only participated in many activities of the organization, but has also written the only authoritative account of the formation and activities of this major organization. It's called NCIC Cultural Persistence, 50 Years of the NCIC. In addition, he has been the chief organizer of several in international Indian diaspora conferences, beginning with the International Ramayan Conference in 1998 under the auspices of the Mahasabha, where he was secretary of the organizing committee. This was followed by five international Indian diaspora conferences at the NCIC Nagar between 2014 and 2021, in which he chaired all the conference organizing committees. Substantial publications have come out of these conferences, thus enhancing academic study in this area of research. As a conference attendee and presenter, he has represented our nation at conferences in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Mauritius, the United Kingdom, Suriname, and India. After he retired from teaching in the teaching service in 2009, he successfully pursued a PhD in cultural studies at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. In the literary field, the name Dr. Primnath Gupta stands out from others in his ability to multitask. 
he has used his extensive experience in teaching and cultural activities to branch off into other areas such as creative writing, poetry, history, biographies, namely in the works of The Impact of Indian Movies on East Indian Identity in Trinidad, The Ram Leela of Sangha Grandi, Cry of the Lotus, two volumes of enlightening poetry, Nandi Village, which features collections of short stories, The Mike Men of Trinidad, Global Indian Diaspora, Charting New Frontiers, and many, many others. Coming from humble beginnings, what makes Dr. Gupta's career outstanding has been his frequent elevation to higher categories in the education system. From teacher one in the Ministry of Education, he became principal one in 1994, school supervisor one in 2006, and is at present since 2016, a part-time lecturer at the University of the West Indies Film Department in the Faculty of Humanities and Education. This is a remarkable upward extension for one who started as a primary school teacher he earned his bachelor's and doctoral degrees while continuing as an educator and promoting his cultural activities. Dr. Gupta has been functioning from the village level to the national level. His cultural activities have been duly noted. His historical writings have recreated a nostalgic past that, has, that many had forgotten, now to be reminded of the way we were. His work on Indian films in the Caribbean has been pioneering and he now teaches the subject at the University of the West Indies. From 2011 to 2015, he served on a cabinet appointed committee, contributing meaningfully to the efforts of the Ministry of Tourism through the Tourism Heritage Advisory Committee. His 19 volume booklet on the Indian diaspora for junior readers is an important source of information on the Indian diaspora for not only teachers and parents, but students in primary schools. Dr. Gupta is currently working with the Emancipation Support Committee and his publisher, Caribbean Education Publishers, encouraging the Emancipation Support Committee to produce a similar series for the African diaspora. He is thus a worthy recipient of this prestigious award from the foremost Indian cultural organization in Trinidad and the Caribbean, the NCIC. We welcome once again, Dr. Sharma, De Grunan Sharma, to present this award to Dr. Primnat Gupta, following which Dr. Gupta. Thank you very much, Dr. Devikinanan Sharma. President of the NCIC, Dr. Devikinanan Sharma, the Vice President of the NCIC and Chairman of the Heritage Center, Senator Deruk Timal, members of the NCIC Executive, brothers and sisters. I feel very honored, indeed I am deeply honored to receive this award from the NCIC. Authoring a book is a long and lonely journey. It takes many hours, days, weeks, months, sometimes years of research and writing to go into the making of a book. For us, it is a labor of love. Most of my books and those of Lakshmi Prasad are focused on aspects of the Indian diaspora, as you heard a son talk about that. So this is a very auspicious moment for me in particular. I am truly honored to receive this distinguished award from the NCIC. In my case, I could not have achieved this without the help of a few people. I've come a long way, 
I've had a very supportive family, and I want to say thanks to them. For that, I want to say thanks to my mentor and my great friend, Professor Brinsley Samaru, who has guided me and who has helped me on this journey of writing. He's a truly, he's a truly gifted man, and I might say one of the most unselfish persons I have ever met. He does so much without ever asking for anything in return. Professor Samaru, I want to publicly thank you very much. I say thanks to my family, my son Dave and my daughter Cassandra Devika for their support and encouragement in writing. And of course my wife Anne for her support in allowing me that space, that quality space so important to focus on writing. You know, we take so much for granted, especially when it comes to our wives. So I want to thank her very much for allowing me that special space I need to write. Once again, yeah. once again, I extend my, our heartfelt thanks and appreciation to the NCIC for recognizing our work, my work and Lakshmi Prasad's work, and presenting us with this distinguished award. I also would like to commend the NCIC for this very important initiative in recognizing our local authors. And we need more of this in this country, recognition of our local authors. I thank you very much. Dr. Premnath Gupta, I'd like to take a moment to recognize uh, some of the members of the NCIC's Board of Directors who are here with us this afternoon. Our second Vice President, Mr. Sahadeo Partap, our Treasurer, Ms. Nirmala Ramsaran, our PRO, Mr. Suraj Deo Mungru, our Cultural Officer, Pandit Kuldeep Ganga Pasad, uh, Ms. Indra Autar. Thank you so much for being with us here this afternoon. This afternoon's feature address will be delivered by Professor Kenneth Ramchan, who has the distinguished honor of being the first professor of West Indian literature. He served as an independent senator under three presidents and is a recipient of a Shaconia Medal Gold for services to literature, education, and culture. He was a pioneer in the field and remains active after retirement as chairman of the NGO Friends of Mr. Biswas. He is, a firm, he is as firm as ever in the belief that uh, has guided his work as a, our foremost literary critic. The function of the critic is to let West Indian readers know what our poets, prose writers, and dramatists have, have uh, sorry, one, my apologies. Our poets, prose writers, and dramatists have produced and to remove the hindrances to people reading and enjoying them and re learning about themselves and their world through creations. Ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome to our podium, Professor Kenneth Ramchand. Thank you very much um, for, this, for the unmasking. President of the NCIC and Vice President and members of the executive, I want to thank you for mounting this comprehensive display of books visual art, pottery, and other artifacts made by people of Indian origin. When you add the song, music, and dance that are also offered at this Indian Heritage Month event, what we have is a statement about identity that is both engrossing and educational. The present display speaks intimately to Trinidadians of Indian origin. 
Exhibitions matter because they are declarations of identity and they are an important source of self-knowledge. In addition, in a country made up of people of different ethnic origins, including mixtures, exhibitions like this allow Trinidadians to see one another as real people living side by side in a space that belongs to all of us. Exhibitions often inspire people to see the value of becoming artists. They give us the pleasure of and the responsibility of discovering the longing that all human beings have to express and to take possession of the spirit that dwells within them. We automatically and daily express spirit in all that we say and do. But we express it more deliberately in recognizable artistic forms. And we express it in forms of our own invention that stretch the accepted forms and create something fresh and new. At its best, art is unsettling. It is against complacent existence, and it is against the status quo. It gives us back our freedom. It liberates us because it shows us how complicated and full of choices our reality has always been in spite of oppression, in spite of indenture, in spite of colonialism, art tells us we, are, we have always been free. At this point, I would like to summon Sipasad Naipaul, father of Vidya Naipaul but a great writer in his own right, the pioneer of Indian writing in English, our first published short story writer, an outstanding journalist who opened the way by serving as a journalist with the Trinidad Guardian between the year of his marriage, 1929, and the year of his death, 1953. Uh, Sipasad's brilliant career can't really be covered here. In 1950, he wrote an article in the Trinidad Guardian that I think ties in, ties in books with pottery and says something about the pottery exhibition that is on. He called his article a primitive but fascinating craft. And he writes the article denying what could have been a misleading title. Because what he shows us in the article, that this is not primitive. This is a very subtle form of art. And this is not craft. Or if it is craft, it is craft that has ascended into art. The article shows that pottery is an art, that the potter is an artist, that pottery is traditional art in our island, and that like most traditional art, it is deeply rooted in our place and in our people. So I'll just give a couple of snippets from the article. It's, it's a well-researched article, 
and he gives a clinical description of moving from the ordinary clay right up to the clay that you use for making things. And then the whole process of drying and baking and mining the thing until it is ready to be fired. All of that is in that article. I don't know where C. Passard got it from. All I have to say is that he was a terrific researcher. And if you want to learn pottery, you could read this article and it's going to help. What he says, pottery in Trinidad is a primitive but fascinating craft. Down at Chase Village, between Shagwanas and Karapichaima, 35-year-old Nanan Gulcharan still practices the craft, much as his ancestors practiced it in the times of the Buddha, and as his own father practiced it, first in India, then in Trinidad. Literally and figuratively, Nanan has inherited the potter's art in his fingertips. And then he describes approaching Nanan. The sun was about to set. The day's work was over. And now, under the low grass eave of his hut, the potter was stooping over a bucket, washing his hands and feet. He seemed a little tired, for he had on that day turned out six dozens of tureens and bowls. And the graciousness of these chaps, however, he talked readily about pottery. And when I murmured a regret that it was late and I could not see him work, he was ready to put his hands to clay once more in order to give a demonstration. First, he pointed out his equipment a length of tread, a knife curved at the end, and a concrete wheel. The wheel is something of an heirloom, for it was made by his father and has been in use for as long as 80 years. And then he describes the process. The wheel settled with a smooth feline momentum. Then, on the middle of the spinning wheel, the potter thumped his lump of clay. With what seemed no more than a light caress of the hand, the lump grew into a cone. With thumb and fingers, the potter fashioned a saucer. He separated this from the cone by passing the length of thread through the clay. There was something uncanny in the deftness, the quiet yet swift accuracy with which he shaped these articles, so varied in size and form. There was a living legacy of an extraordinary kinship between the potter and his pots. The touch of fingers on clay seemed persuasive. They closed round it as round the hand of a friend. I mean, I have done a lot of reading about artists and what it feels like to be an artist. And there is Sipasad Naipaul, with no kind of secondary education at all, writing brilliantly and about the artistic process and recognizing, recognizing the movements of the artist. The potter is aware that his methods are primitive, yet he takes a conscious pride in the antiquity of his craft. He hardened the clay into a bowl before he was seven, and truly, he has the power of the clay. Clay for him is a sacred thing, and he does not forget his heirship to an unbroken tradition of centuries. He exists in clay and by it. And there is, between him and his handicraft, no interposition of elaborate machinery. And so continues 
the ancient craft in the ancient way. Well, I took a chance of, you know, going on at length about this because I really feel it is an early statement by one of our pioneer writers and an artist himself about what it is to be an artist who belongs to a community and who comes out of the community. The present exhibition doesn't only mirror our social and cultural realities. I put in brackets there, recognitions. When you see it, you recognize yourself, you recognize things you know, you recognize peoples you know, you recognize emotions that you share with the artist. It doesn't only offer poignant images and symbols of a past that has often been repressed and which is now in danger of being reburied by the aggressive forces of individualism and materialistic passion. When you look at the exhibition, you feel our repressed past and you feel our turbulent and transitional present. I wish I could say my wife threw away page four. But somebody has thrown away page four. And what I was going to do in, in page four is to talk about the early writers not only like Sipasad Naipaul, but writers like Sam Selvon. And I wanted to point out that Indian writing in English in Trinidad did not begin out of the blue that behind it, there is, and still there exists, an oral tradition which consists of dance, song, storytelling. We think of katak, we think of yags, we think of an oral tradition in which song, dance, music, and words fuse with one another. What looks like a dance performance is also a story or a poem. What looks like a prayer also contains within it a story. There's this very vital tradition, including Kahanis. This vital tradition was always there and was always a form of intimate self-expression. And what we are witnessing in, and we could say it begins in the 20s and 30s and begins to flow powerfully is the infusion of all of this into writing. And the effect of it is to produce a particular kind of writing from our place. And the effect of it is to produce a particular kind of Trinidad language. So we cannot, although we are celebrating the writing and writing in English, 
I mean, just think of the impertinence of those people who tried to deny the vote to people of Indian origin on the grounds that they were illiterate in English. Those people who they were calling illiterate had the highest literacy in their own culture and their own languages. So how can you tell a man who is more literate in his language than you are that he is illiterate because he can't say any name? So it was important for us to take command of this language and infuse ourselves and our way of seeing and thinking and feeling into it. And, and um, that is why I said that uh, the exhibition really takes us into the soul of our people. The link with the oral traditions, which are also which are both religious and secular, the link makes some of our writers so profoundly philosophical without jargon, without abstract words, without long convoluted sentences, without negativity, but with a great positive sense of enjoyment of and particip participation in the world and in the environment, in nature. Almost a religious sense in the philosophy of our earliest writers, and the greatest of them, of course, was Sam Selvon. Just a short reading from his first novel, A Brighter Sun. You know, sometimes when I go back and reread our writers, I tell myself, but how could you have been so sensitive? How come you didn't see this before? You wait 20 years after the book has come out to see it. You'll find that happens to you with a great book all the time. Every time you read it, you find something new, something more exciting, something that makes you feel, I was a fool. I should have seen this before. But of course, we all have a good self-regarding instinct, and we excuse ourselves and say, well, I didn't see it then, but I see it now. And great for the book. Anyway, in this story, A Brighter Sun, the hero who has been married off at a very tender age, as a boy, and really had to behave like a man, so he beat his wife, um, is a learning kind of person. Though. And he puts all this kind of uncouth behavior behind him, but he is agonizing about what is it like to be a person in the world? Is there a God? What is it? What do people mean when they call you a man? What's a man? And in one of his moods, He goes to a grassy place. He swung into 10th Avenue and went into the fields. He remembered the night he had come, when the baby was born. It was plenty different then. He sat down in his garden, and then just to see if the same emotions would overcome him, lay full length on the grass and watched up at the sky. He was smiling to himself. It seemed such a long time ago, but he was a boy then. Now he was, what, a man? 
maybe, but not a man like Joe Martin or Boise or any of the others. They were content. He was not. He remembered how he had planned to sell his first harvest for knowledge to an unknown power. What a waste of tomatoes and okras and lettuce that would have been. For he knew now how to go about searching for knowledge. And the power, the power was all around him. He could feel it throbbing in the earth, humming in the air, riding the night wind, stealing through the swamp. The power was free. All you had to do was breathe it in, deep and full, until your chest felt like bursting and glory in it, in the depth of the night, in the rustling trees, in the immense space between earth and sky. That is a profound philosophical moment that I have to say, it doesn't come out of any European philosopher or Chinese philosopher or African philosophy. It comes out of Indian culture and philosophy. How Selwyn tapped into it, we can never know. But it tap, he tapped into it. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you could see and feel the simplicity and the directness of the language and the lack of pretentiousness as these profound questions are raised. And you would find that about a lot of Indian writing in English, that it's laden with philosophy, but a philosophy that we can appreciate and get into without needing philosophical commentaries or other textbooks and so on. In the uh, contribution that Friends of Mr. Biswas is making to the book display, we have put the writers in several different layers. Um, the first two layers represented the Naipaul connections, Bidya Naipaul, his father, and Neil Bisundat and Vani Kapildeo and the whole generation that followed from the Naipauls. And then a third layer in which may be found Lakshmi Prasad. And after her and with her, the next brilliant generation of women writers it's fantastic what has happened to our writing and writing by women of Indian origin in the last 15 years. Um, you, you have um, Claire Adam, you have um, Lakshmi, you have Vani Kapildeo, you have Ingrid Passad, uh, you have Shivani Ramluchan, a whole set of women writers with superb craft, very sensitive, very intelligent, looking at our world and helping us to understand it. And we need them because even in Lakshmi's writing, you can see that this very chaos that our new women writers are exploring, the frankness, courage, 
outstanding artistic skill, all the uncertainties and transitions, the violence, confusion, and chaos, Lakshmi Prasad, in her gentle, contained way, saw the death of civilization that was coming as the 20th century drew to a close. From her first book to her most recent, she traces the growth in consciousness and self-command of the Indian woman. And I want to end with a short passage from Lakshmi. The, the context is, after the death of her husband, Rabindranath, the heroine, Sastra, moves to Canada with her children. But she cannot let go of her dead husband. It's as if, although we don't have sati here, this woman is committing a personal sati upon herself. She cannot let go of her dead husband and refuses all attempts by her family to match her with someone else. On a return visit to the island, they try to persuade her again, but she refuses until she has a vision in which the dead husband comes to her and asks her to free him, free him from the land of the living. Let him go, let him melt into the universe. And as she frees him, free herself to give up this long sutti that she has imposed upon herself. That doesn't mean she's going out and marry anybody. Eh? At the end of the novel, we find her back in Canada, thinking hard and feeling intensely about what is an uncertain future. She's in Canada, she's in her apartment, she's looking out. Across the city, other communities from all parts of the world were establishing and making lives for themselves. Chinese, Jamaicans, Trinidadians, Italians, Greeks, Indians from the subcontinent, and Indians herself, like herself, from the Caribbean. For all, there were choices. They could be a part of communities, or they could be whom they pleased. Naipaul sees this condition in a more painful way, the free state. For well, the free state, you're just swinging free. You have nothing to hold on to. You can't clutch. There are no roots to clutch anywhere. Each choice carried its own cost. Now, she could not envisage being without choice. It's, it's um, a very important thing that she's writing about here. You have a kind of person for whom choices are being made all along from generation to generation and Lakshmi Prasad has arrived at a point in the novel where the Indian woman has struggled through to the point where she has choice. Looking back to her fortnight in Trinidad, she was glad she had returned. 
She was glad. She had revisited the houses and the gardens, met Govind, met Chandra. Yet, despite the rich pleasure of being with her family, seeing old friends and dear places, she sensed the truth of the dictum. All that was now behind her. All that was of the past. As it became darker and quieter, tiredness began to overpower her. She got up and moved from room to room, drawing the curtains one by one as a cherry-cheeked maid had once done on evenings long ago in Ireland. She was about to draw those of her own bedroom window when it began to rain. The wind-blown drifts striking against the pane. Through the rolling beads of water, through the glass, she could set she could see the morning apple trees and the cherry trees and the night. Two tall pines in the neighbor's garden held her attention. Their giant shadows fell obliquely across the lawn. She stood watching, thinking, and dreaming, saw her younger self lost, untried, standing on a hillock in the snow in a faraway field in Ireland. Her memory slipped. It went further back, and a young man, barely 18, unsure of himself in a classroom, and from within you will grow a fine expense of wings, she heard him say. A fine expense of wings, light and beautiful and strong. With such wings, you will fly to the moon and the stars and the bluest blue of the skies. Her cheeks were wet. Yet she did not feel sad or lonely or lost. And though the task before her was daunting, his spirit came with the wind and she sensed a peace, a strength growing within her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ramchan. Can we show appreciation one more time for our spe future speaker here tonight? And I'd like to take a minute again to recognize one more member for our Board of Directors at the NCIC. He's a lawyer by profession, but this afternoon he's wearing the hat of a photographer, Mr. Brahma Bihari Singh. Thank you so much for being here. Nagada Sangadol recognizes and is taken from the Bollywood film Golio Karas Lila Ram Lila. It celebrates dance to the beat of the drums. Let us welcome once more on stage the Radha Krishna Dance Group.
Skills Group uh, for that exhilarating performance. And that leads us right into another poignant aspect of our program. I now invite uh, Mr. Deru Timo, Chairman of the Heritage Center, to formally launch the NCIC's 2022 Indian Heritage Month exhibitions. Mr. Timo. So at this point, it is my duty, and it is also an extreme point of um, achievement for the National Council of Indian Culture to formally launch this exhibition. So please, just a round of applause, <laughs> because we did not arrange any ribbon cutting. <laughs> and in so doing, I, I would like to, um, you know, recognize and I'd like to acknowledge the tremendous work that has gone into it. Um, the audience here today, through your presence, you have given us the justification, you have given us the encouragement for the NCIC and in particular its Heritage Center to explore other dimensions of our culture outside of the performing arts. And um, you know, listening to our feature speaker today, Professor Ken Ramchan, <coughs> highlight in particular the work of some of our authors, some of our writers, and uh, linking those writings with the, the, with the culture evolving out of the, what our ancestors, what our forefathers brought to this land. You know, he put it in such a very beautiful perspective. And uh, I hope, um, not I hope, I know, Professor, that it would encourage us to work much harder here at the NCIC to highlight some of the insights that you pinpointed in your address to here today. So thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> the exhibition is really um, threefold in that we have the book exhibition coming out of the, the NCIC Heritage Library. Now the Heritage Library is a project that we have started, um, we started uh, three, probably three to four years ago. And uh, like the, um, arrival of our forefathers, and like their struggle, and like their persistence, you know, the library is going through similar phases. And, um, but we are very encouraged by, by what is happening, and we are very encouraged by the response to the call for books from authors. We did receive quite a, a fair amount of books from our local writers, because this year we particularly focusing on our indo begonia writers and those of Trinidad and Tobago who have written on the Indian experience, the Indian history, and they represented the Indian perspectives. So we would like to express appreciation to all, all, our, all those who have contributed um, books to the, uh, to the exhibition. And uh, the other aspect, of course, is our visual arts and uh, designs. And um, we have with us here our curator, uh, Richard Rampasad. And I must uh, commend him for quite a, quite a good job in that um, he's also an artist. And we were able to attract the, from our emerging artists uh, pieces from almost um, 19 local artists, and those are displayed on the walls of this hall that we are sitting in here. And um, I would encourage everyone, you know, to come back again, have a look at the pieces of art that we have on display, and to please, you know, support our local artists. As I said, they are emerging artists, 
And once it's within your power, within your means to purchase a piece of um, art, it would lend that encouragement to them because all the proceeds from the sale of the paintings would be going directly to the, to the artist. Um, the other aspect of the, the visual arts uh, display is, of course, the pottery. And I think it was so timely um, and not coincidental that Professor Ramchand would be able to read that piece from the works of Siposad Naipaul um, on, on the pottery. And our curator, Richard, was able to interact with those families and to encourage them, even coax them, because some of them, some of the older ones are not in the best of health. And he was able to coax them to, to generate some of the pieces that you see before us. And what is happening with the families is that, um, you know, a lot of them are getting into the more of the bread and butter uh, education and um, the economics of the, the pottery, um, the trade is, is not as attractive and cannot, cannot sustain, you know, family and they need to educate members of the family and all those things. So, so it's, um, it's dying and um, we at the Heritage Center, we would be exploring means by which we can ensure that that does not happen. Um, so, and then the other aspect is of course the, um, the display on the early years of Indian cinema in Trinidad and Tobago. Of course, research by uh, Dr. Premnath Gupta, who we, we have recognized here today for his work as a writer. But um, in particular, this display I think when um, Dr. Gupta was asked to do it, you know, we were looking at just maybe 18, 19, 20 posters, but uh, you know, the depth of his research is so immense that it turned out to be quite extensive, but very interesting. And um, you know, that one you would need to put, a some, put aside some time <laughs> and um, come back and actually go through the poster. It is filled with very, very um, detailed information and I'm sure it's going to bring back a lot of memories for, for some of you, as well as the opportunity to bring your younger ones and uh, share those memories with them on the spot. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gupta, for that, um, that work of um, love and that very detailed um, work. So we also, I would also like to thank um, and acknowledge and appreciate, um, you know, um, the, as we have given the recognition to Lakshmi Prasad, and to thank her son who, without hesitation, came in from Barbados to receive the award. We are very honored by that, and we were glad that uh, your family graciously accepted our offer to grant this award to your mom. So thank you very much. Um, I would like to really recognize the work of our Heritage Center Committee and um, you know, the members who have worked so selflessly. Uh, Premnath Gupta is the vice chair of our Heritage Center, Dr. Gupta, um, Professor Brensley Samaru, who always sits at the back, um, who distances himself from the limelight, but who is really uh, tremendous source of inspiration to all of us. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Samaru. And then the other members of the committee, Sarika, um, Sean Ramchit, the dangers with this is that you always tend to leave out <laughs> one or two. Um, Mr. Partap, Sadhu Partap, um, Ms. Amrika Sipasa Rimal, who is not here. And I apologize if I have left out anyone. And then, uh, of course, to you, our distinguished audience. Um, there are quite a few dignitaries present here. And, um, you know, Mr. Chanka Sitaram, the brother of um, Lakshmi Prasad, thank you for being here. I see Dr. Balkaran Singh have joined us. Um, Dr. Bar Balkaran Singh recently did, um, recently launched his book on Ramlila and Felicity very well researched um, book. We encourage everybody to, to, get, to, um, 
I get a copy of that as well. It's truly a um, very inspirational work. And um, Mr. and Mrs. Botiwari, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate your presence, Mrs. Brenda Gopi Singh. And I left it for last, but definitely not the least. I know we have here in our audience um, the artists who have contributed to our exhibition here today. And um, I, I must say many, many, much appreciation to you all for the pieces that you have contributed and your presence here. You know, we, we were really, um, some of us were really blown away by the works that were submitted. Because when we put out the, when we put out the call, we weren't really ex expecting such a good response. And then the variety of the pieces that we got, it's, it's, it's so broad that I think that um, those who will be looking at it will definitely be seeing a lot of things that the whole purpose of art is supposed to bring to us, you know, challenge us, you know, stimulate our minds, stimulate our intellect, stimulate our hearts. And uh, we really appreciate um, receiving those pieces from you. So thank you for that and thank you for your presence. And um, I just wish everybody a safe journey home. We do have some refreshments. Please stay back and please um, view the rest of the exhibition. Um, it is going to run until June the 6th um, from the hours of 2 to 7 p.m. So please spread the word and come back and spend some time with us. We would really appreciate that. So thanks you once again for supporting.